Well, uh, so have you ever seen Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, so it's just my idea here is just that sort of a, just a rambling conversation. You don't really have to be funny, although I bet you will be. But the idea is Pressure. just, uh, you know, I, I respect both of your perspectives on sort of the future of education and where this is all going and what learning is going to look like in the next, you know, in the foreseeable future. And then what institutions might be able to do to help learners, you know, what is that role? So I just thought, you know, what I envision happening is a sort of a freewheeling discussion about, you know, what, as the focus moves to learning rather than education, uh, and as these tools continue to expand what people can learn and how they can learn it and who they can learn it with and when they can learn it, where they can learn it, and so on and so on and so on, you know, what do you see? I mean, I know nobody has a perfectly functioning crystal ball, but as you think about what we'll be looking at in a decade, uh, what do you see? And, and uh, what are the biggest, uh, let's just take it from there, what do you see? Tackle it first. I can start first. So obviously, I'm going to piggyback on George's previous statements. He was just talking about and some of these things. Uh, first of all, I think the major problem or the issue that needs to be addressed by learners themselves is to take uh, basically uh, ownership of their own learning. And they need to realize that they are in control and in charge of their learning. And they are, indeed. Like we somehow educate individuals when they are, while they are in higher education or throughout the entire educational system as if they always need to expect everything smooth and easy, nicely packaged by their instructors. However, the moment they are in the workplace, they all, all, all of a sudden start saying, oh, but everything is not how I was taught, or I was not prepared by the university enough for the workforce, or I'm not whatever. And simply that happens because they never actually thought that they are responsible for their learning. But what is actually very kind of counterintuitive in that process is that the learners themselves, when, once they go to the workspace, they realize what's happening there. But then when they return back again to school, they again have the same school expectations. Everything will be smooth, nicely, easy peasy, etc. Therefore, then the becomes the question is how we can change that whole culture and how all that can change. George already earlier today talked about this kind of uh, workspace and uh, market space uh, change where there will be not so many uh, positions that are presently available and everything can be or many things can be automated or will be automated in a very foreseeable future. Therefore in that process we need to envision learners who are continuously learning or workers who are always learning who are learners and that, that's something where we basically can see then a very very blurred transition between the workplace and learning space. Our institutions need to play a very significant role in that process where they can actually sense what is needed by, by their learners, have that continuous lifelong relationship with their learners or students, we'll call them whatever you want, and help them cater to the next uh, ventures they will have in the market space when they actually see that uh, this present type of skill they have is not sufficient enough, they need to retrain or they need to acquire some additional types of things. George, yeah. you have something else, I'm sure. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, I guess there's a few things that'll be interesting that I'm really quite fascinated by, and I know uh, folks at uh, Penn State here have been thinking hard about this for a while and, and no doubt uh, uh, have their own views. So I'd love to hear from you as well what some of your thoughts are. But I think one of the things that, that, uh, higher, that I'm particularly interested in is what is the role of the university in this learning future? I read an article in Forbes recently that said we've moved from a knowledge economy to a learning economy. Right in the past, it was like, what do you know is critical? And we, we heard this. I, mean, I remember when I was in, I don't know, grade eight or nine, hearing about it's going to be a knowledge economy. And, and it was. It, it is a knowledge economy, or at least it was for a period. And all of a sudden now, knowledge is this state. It's almost like, you know, it's a static point. This is what you know. And learning is this process of continually improving and coming to know more. So in that kind of an environment, what does a university become that in the past has treated students as a product you take in and a product you ship four years later? How are we going to do things differently? And uh, particularly interesting is that I think there's going to be a, a range of winners and losers in this transition. So those systems that are early out of the gate in terms of digital learning, that have identified quickly uh, that there's an opportunity here, that there's a, a way in which we can broaden our influence, we can gain access to a larger uh, population of learners, we can better serve the needs of, uh, of alums that have come through the system in the past. Uh, I think those are the universities or the systems that'll do quite well, actually, because we're at an interesting time where education is complexifying. 
like it, I, just a few examples. OECD recently looked at the profile of students. They're entering higher education later. There's gender shifts and transitions. In the past, it was male dominated. Now, in some regions, it's up to 60, 65 percent females in terms of students entering higher education. Uh, internationalization is a factor. We're starting also to see that the different disciplines that are being offered, they're just, everything's becoming more and more and more complex. And so suddenly the narrative that we used to have of higher education, which was, I graduate high school, I go to university, I get a degree, I get employed, uh, I you know, do whatever, and... Uh, for the same company for yeah, a while. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and all of a sudden, that's, that's not, not, that's gone. I mean, because we, those student profiles, even in the U.S. right now, Less than half of the students in, in the higher education system are full-time traditional students. So that's been an enormous shift. So the reality is we now have a much messier higher education system or needs of a higher education system we've had in the past. So the narrative that we've used up until now is not as valid as it once was. It's still valid for a part of the population, but not all the population. Mm -hmm. So the learning pie has grown enormously. And that means that the university that is visionary and forward-thinking has a really good opportunity to to say, look, what does this landscape look like? How do we meet the needs of these people in this, this system that now don't have the same need they had back then, but have very different but very real needs, whether that's employment related, life satisfaction related. You know, if the robots do take all our jobs, we'll have a lot more leisure time, so we might as well get a few extra degrees. Yeah. Let me take a whack at that new message. Sure. All right, so the new message, I think, is um, education is to, the purpose of education is to provide you the flexibility to chase whatever's next. Right? So it's to prepare you to continue to find something of interest and, and become that. And I think that the, the learner in the future becomes this autonomous, not autonomous because we rely on other people, but this self-directed, um, mission-driven learner. So I, the Stanford just put out a thing called Stanford 2025. They had different groups envision the future of education. And uh, two components of about six that they published on that website, Stanford 2025, that I really liked were, one was, instead of a major, you'll have a mission. Right? In other words, you won't major in political science, you'll come here to try and eliminate poverty in Cleveland. And, and when you're here you're trying to learn how to overcome poverty in Cleveland, you will say, what, what's it going to take for me to go out there and make a difference? And then another change was, they call it looping. So instead of coming in for four years, which really turns into five or six, uh, and then leaving and being an alumni, they, all their people, were, they were calling them populi, right, of Stanford, right? And you, you would come in and you would, you know, do some learning. You'd have this mission, perhaps, that was a different group, but I'm going to combine the two. You'd have a mission. You'd come in. You'd say, oh, what can I do? If I'm going to do this, I should probably take these courses in economics, these in sociology, and maybe... I need to do an independent study on this with that person and that person and that person and, and these other people, so profiles so you can find other. And then so you, you do a little preparation, then you go out and try something. You try and make a difference, and then you come back in and say, well, that was, you know, I, I got part of that right, but now I know I see the problem in a different way, and now I'm ready to do this preparation. There's a constant in and out of Stanford, you know, in for a little preparation, out to try what I'm learning, come back, redefine what I need to know, and back through. And I... I see the, the learners as, I, I like to use the term nomads. They're K-N-O-W, mads, yeah. right? Yeah. Where they're out gathering learning credentials from different organizations that can help them and from individuals that can help them. Yeah. And these credentials are not unlike the, the competencies that you're, you're talking about in, in ProSolo. ProSolo may even end up being a personal tool rather than an institution tool. And uh, so you collect these these credentials from whoever. And if that's my mission, then I might need something from a food bank that certifies that I'm whatever. But anyway, I think the learners will ultimately realize that that old top-down system is not serving anybody well and that they do need to take control. And it may not take four years, six years, and it may never end. And it may be a constant recycling. As I see something new that I want to accomplish, I'm out there. And I, th I think that, that, that that's a really interesting point. Obviously, it has something to do also. It tells us something how it's changing the lives, will be changed of the future generations. In many cases, we are presently trained with our university degrees to have lifelong careers, right, in many different fields. And this basically tells us that many types of skills that will be 
having in the future will not be sufficient for our lifelong careers and we will be very much focusing on particular types of missions and which are probably cycles of five to six years where individuals will be working on certain projects and they'll be thinking about the next future step. Obviously something has to be thought through as well in terms of the consequences of the human and their lifestyles, etc. But I'm going to not go into that uh, route. The other point I was also thinking is we are always thinking about what universities can do for learners. And that's really important, the core question. But the other question also comes to my mind is we always think that universities are those factories of knowledge production where we have top researchers in many systems and they are producing that knowledge, which is then eventually transferred or taught to our students. However, to some extent, present universities are not real learning organizations. They really don't learn from all the stakeholders who are in the process. And there is no easy way that that, uh, that knowledge, which is produced by all the stakeholders in the process, to be easily transferred to others and then to be propagated. So for example, if I'm taking that mission that you just mentioned to solve the problem of poverty in Cleveland, then I'm also having something to contribute back to the university and that other students can benefit from that process. Therefore, what I'm actually thinking in that sense is that we need to look for alternative models where the universities will be also integrating learners as potentially knowledge contributors in the mm -hmm. process. And that knowledge will also be then made available to other students so that that can be then integrated into their skills and needs. And that way, universities will become much more responsive to the future needs of learners. At the same time, will be much more responsive at the sharing experience that learners may need. So presently, we offer learning opportunities, but we live in institutions that are not learning organizations. That's my mm -hmm. point. Good point. So, so Bill Sams, I don't know if you know, if you've ever seen uh, Epic 2020, but he did this thing, this uh, sort of, in a way, the music and uh, images make it seem like a doom and gloom kind of thing where, you know, in, in uh, 2008, MOOCs came on the scene and people registered and da 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 and he rolls it forward, rolls it forward until Amazon, there's like Amazon and merges with Apple and they become Apple's on and they offer all these things and, you know, da 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 Well, provocative. So we had him out as a speaker and it was really good. And I think, I think uh, the Amazon image of, of education is probably realistic in that, you know, as you say, the, the universities tend to end up influencing and also emulating the society and the way the society communicates and so on. And I can see an Amazon.com type marketplace for learning opportunities with, you know, ratings and everything and some smaller credentials and all that. So we brought Bill Sams in and we're talking to him and he said, somebody said, well, what do we have to do to sort of save Penn State University? And he said, if that's your goal, then, you know, you're going to fail. The question you need to ask is, what are learners going to need from us as all this rolls forward and, and as content can be found anywhere? Great content can be online, accessible to anyone. What will they need from us? And I think I'd love to, well, I'm going to stop right there and get your responses to that. What will learners in a future where content is available, what is it that they need from us? Well, see, it, it's, uh, this always the, the difficulty is, you know, you watch a video like this 10 years down the road and you're like, boy, that guy back there was an idiot. <laughs> so I'll say this with that in, in the back of my mind that I'm an idiot. But uh, the needs, I think, of students or of I individuals. I saying he was brave to take that Oh, spot, yeah, there you go. <laughs> go ahead, be brave. A, who's the pessimist? Who's the optimist? Uh, the opportunities, I think, around identifying learners' needs are really quite significant because learners themselves, it's not like they know what they necessarily need. It's kind of this idea that Steve Jobs talks about, you know, if you, if you ask people what they want, sometimes they just want a bigger something that they already have. So to understand that maybe they need something completely different, entirely different, I think is an interesting opportunity for universities to think about. And, and I do want to emphasize we're at an exciting time in higher education where what the decisions that this generation and probably part of the next generation of leaders is going to be making. They're going to create the shape of learning 
uh, for likely generations in the future. So it's a really valuable time to be thinking deeply about complex things such as the, the role of people in the learning system, especially if we're going to use more technology. Can we make that process actually more human than, than what it currently is? So I'm, I'm an optimist in that regard that, that we're going to start to see some really promising opportunities for us, but I think there's also a bit of a heavy burden on the part of leaders is that you really have to make sure that you understand what is happening with information and knowledge so that you're not necessarily just saying, because the students, the learners don't know what they need in a lot of cases. Uh, I don't, I, as a learner, I don't know what I need. So if there's times where someone's done some visionary forward thinking, it can be quite valuable for me to be the recipient of that. So one of the things I would like to say is that if you look at the aspects of the learning process, so let's just look at what are the parts that are involved when I'm in a, in a university. So the first thing is content, namely the curriculum that we're trying to communicate to our students. And that content, there's a separate layer, which I'm not going to talk about, that's the research dimension. But I'm just talking about the teaching and learning process, uh, even though there's a bit of in influence from research into all of three stages. So there's the content piece. And there's this, the second piece, which is the teaching piece. So we might have our textbooks that we wrote, or we might just have our PowerPoints that we go through, and, and, and that's the teaching practice. The third thing that we have is the assessment or the credentialing processes. And so those three elements are what right now are the value points of education. Now, all of those rely on this thing called information. And uh, information right now is undergoing a bit of a metamorphosis in terms of of the power relationships within it. Who creates it, who shares it, who owns it, and so on. Textbook publishers are losing some of their influence. There's a growing uh, development of peer-to-peer -peer and social interactions. So we're finding hierarchical institutions that have traditionally functioned well are now sort of at a bit of a, uh, they're, a bit, they're reeling a little bit. And so then what's the, what's the value point of a university to a learner's life? Well, the content they can, you know, you Google, use any search engine, hit Wikipedia, more increasingly you go to a series of MOOCs, you can take really good quality content in a lot of cases and it's not going to cost you a penny or if anything with you know, a subscription fee that's minuscule. All right, so that means that the first value point for students of learning of the university system is now really negated, the content piece. The second piece that we hold to, and this is when MIT first did OpenCourseWare initiative, they said, yeah, but you know what, the content's not valuable, but the teaching is. That's why students come to MIT, so that's what they want to pay for. Well, then MOOCs arose, and all of a sudden now you've got some of the best profs in the world teaching some of their content to a global audience. So if you're sitting in a small state college somewhere and your prof uh, you know, ha doesn't have that extensive experience, and then the very textbook that your prof is, is having you read is written by the author of the person that's running a MOOC on, on edX. So then suddenly it's like, hmm, how valuable is that in-person teaching experience? So, and then that leaves a third point, which is assessment and credentialing. And that's a leg of the stool that still has enormous value because that's what students need when they're learning in a mess of different places, how to get that validated. Now I'll just backtrack slightly to make one final point. The only way in which teaching cannot be negated as a value point in education is if we transform our pedagogical practices, which means that instead of lecture formats, which you record a lecture once, you can watch as many times as you want, as many people want to watch as possible. But if you change your practice, suddenly you work with active learning. You work with immersive learning. You work with problem-based learning. You have students work in case situations. Suddenly, that's a process that you can't duplicate. So the interesting aspect of technology is it negates the economic value of things that can be duplicated with limited cost. Content, we can say that's eliminated as economic value. Teaching, from an instructive sense, I could say has been eliminated as an economic value. So the university has two particular strands to focus on now quality of its credentialing and assessment process and the identity that the university brings to it, and then the uh, transformative pedagogical practices. I think I'd add, based on something you said earlier, Dragon, to that, the uh, creation of social, and, and the, the MOOC in your whole philosophy, I didn't mean to exclude you from this, but the, the uh, idea that there is a social layer that the university can provide, that an individual may not bring to a learning, uh, a learning experience that the university can say, come here, study with us, because you become part of this stream of people uh, that are studying this now, and everybody who studied it before you, and everybody who will study it after you. And you become part of this community uh, around this topic. So, and I think that that's the role or the function that the university serves presently, and something which is really so difficult to beat with any other types of technologies, right? That type of social experience that students have, and more important, these types of social ties that students have, spending four years of life with on campus with certain individuals, or even just two years as a grad student, gives you certain connections that you cannot so easily capitalize otherwise. This is, I think, for many reasons, uh, 
content is quite similar in many MBA schools, but whether you are studying at Stanford or MIT or Penn uh, is is much different than whether you are studying in some other system, simply because you are getting access to the top uh, decision makers and business leaders in the future. And you form yeah, a network of people who go out and are successful in the world and contribute exactly. to your success. How much of that can be done online? So a lot of the, we're talking about this, the Ivy Leagues and whatever, you go there, you become part of this network of people and they carry you with them, you know, you care, they carry each other out into success. Can you create that same kind of uh, support structure with, with online uh, interactions using Skype, Zoom, whatever, or whatever comes next or whatever comes next. Now, there's, is there, how much value is there to the face-to-face -face I think experience? the value of face-to-face -face, uh, cannot easily be replaced. We can compensate many of these types of things. Uh, I, I was earlier also today talking about this model of community of inquiry. I'm trying to pretty much teach in that way, but also the research around the model as well, and also thinking how that model potentially can be expanded into the network environments or completely redefined so that we have something that will help us. One of the key points of that model is social presence, mm -hmm. that learners basically start looking at each other as human beings, not just simple avatars. They can actually say whatever they want, and that basically there is a bit of a big sense of entitlement. And that is something that university and teaching comes into the store. It's not the information itself, but it's more scaffolding of those interactions that universities can provide. So you can, uh, and Terry Anderson, uh, he's also with Athabasca University, one of the most prominent, I would say, of online learning researchers in general, is always saying it's not that difficult to develop a, a social network in software. It is much more difficult to populate it to develop something which will attract people to go there. And that is something where the university can build the role. That can be done inside the courses, but that can be done also outside of these courses and in some of these informal spaces. We have to be intentional in that process. Uh, social interactions may happen, but if you want them to be more effective, we need to design those. And universities need to build their capacities around teaching these types of uh, skills and interactions rather than just to teach how to go from page A to page B. I think that's something that students will get many other opportunities to get. However, to teach students or to scaffold how to engage with any different individuals or additional organizations or many other opportunities, that's something where the university can play a still very significant role. Yeah. Scaffolding interactions, that's sort of the way, the way you described uh, moving away from lecture into the active experiences. Uh, if you do that, the scaffolding of interactions becomes easier because they've got real, you know, real work to interact around, right? So it's, it's kind of, I, I, I'm uh, predicting that it'll be a lot more, a lot more easy and will be a lot more productive at scaffolding interactions as we move students to, uh, to real work. So I say, there's, there's knowledge and comprehension level objectives, and let's push those out to places, MOOC-like places, where people can do that on their own and with peer support. And any time we bring people together, and I, by that I mean face-to-face -face or even online in real time, let's do things we can only do when they're together. Right? Exactly. And so, and then let's scaffold those powerful interactions. What is it about this content that made me say we have to be together? And then let me do something powerful enough to justify the expense and the inconvenience and, and, and of bringing a whole bunch of people together at the same time. And let's figure out how to do powerful things with the times that we bring people together. And then and understand what things can be accomplished at the, yeah. the lowest level of inconvenience and, and interruption. You know, let's let people do everything at the you know, least intrusive mm -hmm. level. And that and free up all this time for the higher order stuff that requires expert facilitation and requires uh, higher order kinds of assessments and all that. So, yeah, you know, I would say there was a the U.S. Department of Education did a report. I think Barbara Means from SRI uh, was was the, an author on it that looked at what is the evidence for online versus you know, 
in-person learning. And uh, that's been a, a topic ever since we started moving online. People have been arguing that online can't be as good as teaching in a, in a classroom setting because there's you know so and so and the teacher and the this and that. But uh, the research results don't support that. Uh, they, they support that online learning can be as effective uh, as in-classroom learning. In some cases, it can actually be more effective. But what was interesting from that particular Department of Education report was that blended learning actually exceeds both. And so there's this sense in which we do need that social time together. There's something that happens that isn't only cognitive when you're together with a group of people. There's, there are affective dimensions. There are emotional dimensions. So it's not just that when we learn content, it's not just about the content. It's about the experience of becoming interactive knowledge developers where I have part of an idea and I hand it off to you and you play with it and hand it back to, to Dragon and drag. you know, that, that process just keeps going. Now we can do that online to a certain degree, but there's something about the richer social experience of meeting in person that uh, continues to provide value for that, the deepening of relationships. And yet, when you've done both though, you have the benefit of those, the loose tie relationships that can happen quickly online, the short Skype chats without having an hour and a half listening to a lecture. And yet then when you get together in person, those relationships, and I've had this with numerous students that have interacted online that have then met in person, where they find it's almost like you, you, you met an old friend who you've never met before, and all of a sudden it's like, wow. So, so there's dimensions there that we can't quite quantify or qualify yet that happens when we're meeting in person and when we're learning. Yeah, but in all that process, we really need to emphasize that online interaction between learners. Otherwise, that, that will not happen, right? Mm -hmm. And there are certain things that simply cracking a joke uh, when we are face to face right. happens so spontaneously and is not so easy to do that online, right? So you are missing all these cues. The other thing is you need to be much more intentional when you are meeting with some of your classmates. You need to schedule some time when you are available and then start a Skype, Skype chat. Obviously. Time zones can also play a role in that process, et cetera, while time zones can be mitigated with online learning at the same time, they are also a barrier for these types of interactions. So we're talking about interactions that go well beyond post something in a forum and comment on at least three people's posts. You know? <laughs> oh, no, that's the perfect pedagogical right. model. So, uh, and I, I think your point about the, the Barbara Means study, uh, the meta-analysis of, of the online versus face-to-face -face learning, uh, part of that is because the, the educational outcomes that we're asking for are pretty much knowledge and comprehension level in general. And if you get up to the higher order things like scaffolding interactions, if you're going to train people to scaffold interactions, you know, or, or to, to facilitate, uh, you know, to mediate conversations. We have people here who are trying to figure that out. You know, then that's something that's going to be much more difficult to do. When you move up the hierarchy of cognitive uh, learning outcomes up into the synthesis and evaluation and yes. higher order stuff, I think it gets harder to do. I'm not saying you can't do it. And that's what other studies have shown, the Clark and all uh, back from the 70s on. It's not so much about the medium as it is about the design of the interactions, about what goes on in the person's mind. Mm. And if a designer understands that and understands what needs to happen, then you can say, oh, this has to be done through a role play. Yeah. We're going to have to sit this out. You're going to have to be the superintendent, or somebody's going to have to be the superintendent, the principal, the parent, the and we're going to have to wrestle this out. And then we'll, get, then we'll have an understanding that will last longer and will, will mean more than reading something in a text. But, well, great. Well, other things you want to talk about when you, when you think of the future? Have we, have we uh, done a pretty good job of thinking about what the future might be like and, and where it might be going and how universities or other educational institutions can help? Well, I think and this, is, this is an interesting trend that we're seeing already. Now, it's coming out of MOOCs. And I just want to emphasize MOOCs, I think, are a bit of a short-term trend uh, as, as a name, uh, as, a, mm -hmm. as a concept. And uh, this idea of learning at scale and multi-institutional learning and ready access to learning, I mean, those principles are there for the long run. But one of the things that's becoming increasingly interesting is who's all involved as a learning provider. And getting to the point where learning is really a form of marketing with some organizations. Google runs a MOOC on how to search with Google. Uh, you have companies that run uh, the recent uh, initiative that was announced with uh, Khan Academy and Bank of America on financial planning. And so I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch unfold is that in a learning economy, all of a sudden, you have everyone 
has to participate. And for learners, what a tremendous opportunity. I mean, the, the number of free learning options, and free is really not the critical thing, but it's an important mm -hmm. thing, but the number of options, I can go today and I can learn almost anything through some of the top respected scholars uh, in the world. I can learn anything, whether you're dealing with biochemistry, whether we're dealing with nanotechnology or neuroscience or, or statistical computing or machine learning. I mean, these are topics. It's, it's amazing to see where they're at. And what it reveals to me, I think, and this is something that's going to drive trends forward, is that we had, for probably, I don't know, decades, we had this demand need for learning build. And yet universities largely stayed the same. So they didn't realize that their student was changing, that the marketplace for learning was changing. And so while this demand was building and building and building underneath, you had a few cases where you might find uh, listserv started to serve a learning purpose. So folks who are, let's say, learning Python could connect on a, on a listserv and share and do stuff there. But universities kind of ignored that as, and that's not us. And then all of a sudden with MOOCs, everything sort of burst through the surface. And I think MOOCs were really a supply side answer to this decades long demand side increase in learning needs. And so all of a sudden our competition isn't going to be exclusively other universities. It's not going to be a university in China or a university in Australia. All of a sudden Khan Academy and Bank of America and, and World Bank and UNESCO and whoever, they're all offering these learning needs. And that Code gets, Academy. And yeah. yeah. So, so it's really, I mean, it's a terrific time. If, if you enjoy learning, you pick the right time in history to be alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, and at the same time also, it's a great time that we are having these serious conversations about the presence of universities, because finally universities are getting aware, especially MOOCs, not necessarily that MOOCs were innovation by themselves, at least how they were deliver, delivered from uh, 2012 uh, onward, uh, but rather more as increasing the awareness of universities that they need to change something. They need to start self-reflecting on what they are doing presently mm -hmm. and what needs to be done. And that's why we are seeing much more legit now requests to have, and much more attention also paid by universities to have these active learning approaches, flipped flip classrooms, and so on. So we are actually seeing some, uh, it's not revolution, but it's a nice evolution, I would yeah. say. It's a kind of fast forward evolution happening inside of the institutions. There were in the past also some individuals, but they were really very enthusiastic individuals. What is also happening is, in that process, is we know that many faculty members are driven by their research track record because universities are primarily assessing them, especially top tier mm -hmm. systems such as Penn State. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, these types of initiatives are offering additional research opportunities for many academics who are not necessarily coming, coming directly from right. educational research. Right. I'm a computer scientist, and, uh, <coughs> and, and many other computer scientists all of a sudden uh, found themselves in the space of education. And, Although some of us really are just rediscover, rediscovering what, what's been around for 30, 40 years. Others are engaged into much more rewarding uh, research opportunities there. And they can publish in top tier journals in their home fields. We, for example, have Scott Klammer, uh, one of the keynote speakers at the Learning Analytics Conference last year in Indianapolis. And he, he is a really good example how a human computer interaction researcher can also uh, see his future research opportunities in this mm -hmm. space of MOOCs. And we can also see some uh, really leading physicists or other researchers who yeah. are finding the home in that space. So I'm seeing that great, not only from the perspective that they are building now uh, just their research profiles, but that research <coughs> is now becoming much more connected with their teaching as well. And I think that's something which is really important. In, in I, I really wish we can, if we can build next generation of academic scholars who are uh, both researchers in their academic fields, but they are also researching teaching of their fields as well. All right. Well, I'd like, like to thank you for uh, this conversation. I enjoyed it, and I, it was everything I'd hoped it would be. Thank you very much for helping us think about uh, what lies ahead. Great. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure.